So today we're going to continue our discussion of atomic structure and periodicity, looking a little bit more at how electrons behave and then relating that to electron configuration in the periodic table. So first, um, let's continue our discussion of quantum numbers. We had already talked about the first three, n, l, and m sub l, and then our fourth one is electron spin. And so it basically says that an electron has two spin states, and it's based on the magnetic field. And so the electron spin quantum number is m sub s, so s for spin. It can have two values, either positive one-half or negative one-half, meaning it's going to spin clockwise or counterclockwise. All right, so let's relate all of our quantum numbers to some principles. So we have the Pauli exclusion principle. So what this says is that no two electrons can have the same set of four quantum numbers. So each electron is going to basically have its own kind of map or address, and that's kind of what these quantum numbers indicate. So an orbital can only hold two electrons, and then they must have opposite spins. So an orbital is going to have the same n, l, and m sub l, except now it's going to have the two different m sub s values, and so that's how we make sure that no electrons have the same four quantum numbers. So let's look at what are called polyelectronic atoms. Basically includes everything but hydrogen, because polyelectronic means that it has more than one electron. And there are three energy contributions that these uh, electrons can make. So first we have the kinetic energy of the electrons as they move around. Remember, they're moving, so that's kinetic energy. Then we have the potential energy of the attraction between the nucleus and the electrons. The nucleus contains positive protons and electrons are negative. They attract. And then our third type of energy is the potential energy of repulsion between two electrons. Electrons don't attract because they're both negative. Okay, so we have this electron correlation problem. So previously we talked about the Schrodinger equation, and it cannot be solved exactly when applied to helium. And this has to do with its wave function. Well, once we move past hydrogen, we have more than one electron, and this can cause some problems just like it did with the Bohr model. So this electron correlation problem says that since electron pathways are unknown, remember we talked about how we just have electron probability, Electron repulsions cannot be calculated exactly. So once we add more than one electron, we have these repulsions. And that's why this occurs only with polyelectronic atoms, which is basically everything but hydrogen. So we need to make approximations. We're going to treat each electron as if it were moving in a field of charge that is the net result of the nuclear attraction and the average repulsions of the other electrons. So we kind of make some assumptions. So let's look at some hydrogen-like orbitals, even though all of our atoms are polyelectronic except for hydrogen. So outer electrons, we know, are not bound as tightly because they're what we call shielded. And so those outer electrons have inner electrons that are shielding basically the nucleus from those outer electrons, so they're not feeling the pull of the nucleus as much, and so they're not bound as tightly. So we could say outer atoms have hydrogen-like orbitals, they have the general shapes, but the sizes and energies are going to be different. And so let's look at some of that. So for polyelectronic atoms, given the principal quantum level, the orbitals are going to vary in energy. Remember how we said that anything with the same value of n, that principal quantum level, had the same amount of energy. Well, this can change a little bit within that principal quantum level. So remember we talked about we had those different shapes for the uh, L values. We had S, P, D, and F. Well, if they all have the same principal quantum number, so let's say 4, uh, F would have the highest energy because those are more shielded, they're further away from the nucleus, than the S or the P or the D. And so within one principal energy level, we have different amounts of energy. The more effectively an orbital allows its electron to penetrate the shielding electrons to be close to the nuclear charge, the lower the energy of that orbital. So the better that outer electron is at being attracted by the nucleus, the lower its energy. Well, F is really shielded, so it's got higher energy. Okay, so let's relate these quantum numbers to the periodic table and start talking about electron configuration. The periodic table was originally constructed to represent patterns of their observed in chemical properties of elements. And so we have kind of this timeline before we got to our current one. So we had Johann Dabereiner. 
he was the first to recognize patterns and elements, and he called them triads because he was finding these groups of three that were similar. And then we had John Newlands who went from triads to octaves, saying that he was finding patterns between eight elements. And now our modern periodic table was contributed to by Julius Meyer and Mendeleev, and he emphasized that the table could predict properties of future elements. And that's why his was so revolutionary, because he left these spaces, and then later on elements were discovered that fit into those spaces. So the only difference between Mendeleev's periodic table and the one we use now is that we list elements in order of atomic number rather than atomic mass. And, but if you look, it does follow the same pattern except for a few differences. Okay, so let's relate all of our quantum numbers to our periodic table. So the off-ball principle says that as protons are added one by one to the nucleus to build up the elements, uh, electrons also get added. And one orbital must be full before another can accept electrons. So when we talk about electron configuration and orbital filling, we must fill those lower energy orbitals first before we can go on to the next one. So hydrogen, because it only contains one electron, fills the lowest energy level, which is 1s1, or lowest energy orbital. Now we're going to go to hydrogen and add another electron. Well, remember we said that each orbital could hold two electrons, and so we've got to fill that lower energy one first before we can move on. So helium is 1s2. Then we go to lithium. We're adding another electron. We're also moving up an orbital, so we have 1s2 full, and then we're going to 2s1. Okay, and we're going to keep following this pattern. Brillium, then we fill the 2s. Now for boron, we filled 1s and 2s, so now we can go to 2p. Okay, well, let's take a look at a, a few other rules that relate to all this electron configuration. Once we get to carbon, we filled the 1s, the 2s, and now we're into the 2p, and we have 2p2. Well, there are three 2p orbitals all with the same energy. If you remember when we looked at the pictures, we had 2px, 2py, and 2pz, based on the orientation. Well, mutually repulsive electrons will occupy separate 2p orbitals. Remember, electrons don't want to connect, they want to repel, and they spin in opposite directions. And so they're going to fill separate 2p orbitals if they can. And so what Hund's rule says is that the lowest energy configuration, because we're always wanting the lowest energy, for an atom is the one having the maximum number of unpaired electrons allowed by the Pauli principle in a particular set of orbitals. So what this means is that they're going to occupy individual orbitals within that energy level before doubling up. So orbitals will double up once each orbital has one electron. And then remember, when they do double up, we want them to have opposite spins because no, elect no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. And so for oxygen, we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. If you remember when we drew orbital diagrams, if I just draw the one for 2p, remember it's got three different orbitals, so we have one electron, two electron, three electron. Now that each orbital has one, now they will start doubling up, and we represent those electrons with arrows to show the spin. Okay, well, this could add up to a lot of writing if you know once we got way down into the periodic table. So there's also a way to shorthand our electron configuration. And we can use noble gases to shortcut it. So let's take a look at sodium. Sodium is right here. It has 11 electrons. If we wrote out its whole electron configuration, it'd be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s1. And that's not too long, but it could get longer as we keep going. Well, we can use noble gases to shortcut that electron configuration. If you take a look at neon, neon is right before sodium, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 is neon's electron configuration. And so instead of writing this whole quantity, we can just put that noble gas in brackets and then continue on with our electron configuration. Keep in mind that only noble gases can be used to shortcut. Okay. So we also need to talk about valence electrons, which are the most important electrons because they're on the outside okay, and they are used in bonding. Uh, and they also determine some of the chemical properties for our atoms. And so then we also have these core electrons, which are basically the inner electrons. 
or the ones that do the shielding. So elements in the same group, and remember, groups are vertical, so we could look at group one, the alkali metals, and they all have one valence electron. If you remember from sodium, it was neon 3s1. Potassium is argon 4s1. So they both have one valence electron, and it, that pattern continues for all of group one. So elements in the same group have the same valence electron configuration. So if we look at potassium, which we just talked about, argon 4s1, it's got one valence electron. So electrons with the same valence electron configuration also have similar chemical properties, and that's one of the nice things about the periodic table. It arranges elements based on their similarities. And so if we looked at group 2, all of these have two valence electrons. Transition metals are a little bit different, and so we kind of talk about them separately. Transition metals occupy the d orbital, and so this entire box here. And they tend to go out of order. So first we talk about 4s, and then we go to 3d. And you might be saying, well, 3 is a smaller n value. It's got less energy. It should be listed first. But when it comes to 3d, or, and when it comes to d's, we kind of go out of order a little bit because of the energy. And so let's find scandium. And so argon is the previous noble gas. And so then we're going to start with 4s2 and 3d1. There are some anomalies besides flipping the S and the D, or the, you know, the 4 and the 3. Um, some other anomalies would be chromium, which is located here. And so what happens is normally we would say 4S2, 3D1, 2, 3, 4. But what happens is an electron is taken from the 4S because if 4S is listed first, it has lower energy. And so the 3D is taking the electron from the 4S to make it half full. This makes it more stable. And so it might seem kind of backwards, but having half an orbital is more stable than having like a, a weird in-between half, where 4 isn't really half full. Copper is the same way. So if we look at copper, if we were doing normal electron configuration, we would say 4s2, 3d9. Well, again, it's like almost full, but not quite. And so what's going to happen is it's going to take an electron from the s and give it to the d. And so now the d is totally full, and 4s is half full. And that's a more stable configuration. So those are some things that you need to keep in mind and remember, just chromium, copper, and, and those transition metals. OK, some other important facts. So the n plus 1 s orbital always fills before the n d orbital. So this example is exactly what we just talked about. 4s filling before 3d. And then same thing, 5s filling before 4d, etc. And this is because 4s is lower in energy, and so it's going to be filled first. After lanthanum, and so here is lanthanum. The lanthanide series occurs, and it has 14 elements, and it actually goes right here. And so it fills the 4f orbital. Sometimes the electrons will occupy 5d instead of 4f because the energies are so similar. So that's kind of something to just keep in mind. And then same deal with actinium, which goes right here, is the actinide series. It's also got 14 elements, and sometimes... It will, so it will fill the 5f orbital, and sometimes electrons will occupy 6d instead of 5f. Same idea, energies are similar. We also have group labels. So if you check out your periodic table, they're labeled 1a through 8a. This does not include transition metals. So we have 1a, 2a, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. And this indicates the total number of valence electrons. Remember, so we're not using transition metals. So previously we talked about how this group, uh, alkali metals, had one valence electron. Well, this is also telling you that, whoops, so you don't have to do electron configuration to figure it out every time. And these group labels are also called main group or representative elements. So every member of the group has the same valence electron configuration, and only the principal quantum number of those valence electrons changes. So where with hydrogen you've got 1s1, whoops. And then lithium you know, ends in 2s1, 3s1, 4s1. So we're increasing energy, but same number of valence electrons. 
Okay, so here are the check for understanding questions for the fourth section. Fourth? Yeah. Electron configuration. Number one, describe the fourth quantum number. Number two, what is the Pauli exclusion principle and how does it relate to quantum numbers? Number three, explain what it means for an electron to experience shielding. How does this relate to the energy of sublevels within the same principal energy level? Number four, what is the off-ball principle and please give an example. Number five, what is Hund's rule? And also please give an example of that. Number six, how can electron configuration be shortened? And again, please give an example. Number seven, where are valence electrons found? Why are they important? How do valence electrons relate to groups on the periodic table and why is this significant? And number eight, explain why tungsten is considered an anomaly for or with electron configuration. Okay, so we'll discuss these in class. Have a good day.